Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anna Perez, and in this life, I'm a fellow here at the Institute of Politics. Politics and popular culture was the subject of my study group, and I see some of my liaisons are in the audience. Thank you. <laughs> my job today, however, is to welcome everyone to this part of the sixth annual Arts First 98 Festival at Harvard. This is the first year the Forum has participated in this glorious celebration of one of the most important aspects of our society. We are very happy to be included in this weekend's more than 200 exhibitions, performances, screenings, events, and happenings. Haven't heard that word in a few years. <laughs> All designed to celebrate the craft and the creativity of students and faculty in the arts at Harvard. This is also the perfect time to recognize Harvard's newest family member, the Institute on Arts and Civic Dialogue, created and sponsored by the American Repertory Theater and the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for Afro-American Research. In the fall, you will welcome the Institute's director, the acclaimed artist, writer, and performer, Anna DeVere Smith. And Andrea Taylor, the deputy director, is here today. Walter Lippmann once described culture as, quote, what people are interested in, their thoughts, their models, the books they read, the speeches they hear, their table talk, gossip, controversies, historical sense and scientific training, the values they appreciate, the quality of life they admire. The culture of a people, Lippmann continued, is the climate of their civilization. Our panel today is ideally suited to provide weather reports on the climate of our civilization. The topic is Visions of America, the Artist's Perspective on Society. Our artists in residence today include exemplars from the worlds of theater, filmed entertainment, and popular music. And as you will undoubtedly see this afternoon and hear, their worlds overlap big time. Following a five to seven minute presentation by each member of our panel, we'll be happy to take questions from the audience. Please remember when audience members are recognized for your question to identify yourselves for our guests. Our first panelist, I'm gonna go through the introductions for all of the panelists and then we'll welcome them one at a time to the podium. Our first panelist today is Michael Corey, who has written the book and lyrics of Dahl, a new Broadway bound musical composed by Scott Frankel based loosely on the obsessive love affair between painter Oscar Koshkoshka, not bad, and Alma Mahler, muse of the ages. Corey is also the, lib the librettist of four operas composed by Stuart Wallace, Harvey Milk, their best known collaboration, premiered to international acclaim at the Houston Grand Opera. The San Francisco Opera premiere elicited this review from the San Francisco Chronicle, stunning by turns haunting, haunting and hilarious, brassy and mystically poetic, a magnificent creation. Michael's newest libretto to Wallace's music, Hopper's Wife, receives the New York Foundation of the Arts Playwrights Fellowship. It imagines, I love this, it imagines a marriage between Edward Hopper and Hollywood columnist Hedda Hopper. <laughs> Premiering last spring in California, the Los Angeles Times called the piece brave, bold, and important. If you want a notion of one possible direction for American opera in the next millennium, Hopper's wife needs to be your destination. Where's Dick, a satire of cartoon violence, was developed at Playwrights Horizon and premiered at Houston Grand Opera. Where's Dick is now being developed, it gets better, now being developed as the first ever animated opera. For his second collaboration with Wallace, Corey Michael based his libretto to Kabbalah on ancient mystical texts, merging them with original writing he translated into the languages of the diaspora. Michael is currently collaborating on a new work with Wallace tentatively titled High Noon, an Exploration of the Showdown. They will develop this work, the work this summer as part of the Institute on the Arts and Civic Dialogue, and Michael's gonna tell you a little bit more about that really interesting creation um, when he gets to the podium. Our second columnist comes from my world, or really it's his world, and he just welcomed me to it. Fred Zolo, Frederick Zolo, is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Boston University with graduate work at the London School of Economics and a master's degree in fine arts from Brandeis University. In 1985, Newsweek dubbed Zolo one of America's brightest young producers. 
Since then, Mr. Zolo has been one of Broadway's and Hollywood's most prolific and distinguished producers, a two-time Tony Award winner. Fred has also been nominated for both the Academy Award for Mississippi Burning and the Emmy Award for In the Gloaming. His directorial debut, Talk Radio, by Eric Bogazian at Joseph Papp's Public Theater prompted Frank Rich of the New York Times to write, Fred Zolo has given the world a broadcasting authenticity, setting it within the equivalent of a high-tech bunker. He does not waste words or time. Howard Kissel of the Daily News summed up the rest of the rave notices by saying, talk radio is directed with the special energy of people who know they're doing something hot. Mr. Zolo directed one other play, Avenue Boys, by Frank Pugliese. Close enough? For this, his only other such effort, he earned the Obie Award for Outstanding Direction of a Play. He serves on the Board of Governors of the Th League of Theater Owners and Producers and is a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And now, I'm not going to read you all of Fred's credits because we would be here until tomorrow morning. But on Broadway, he's produced Buried Child by Sam Shepard, Angels in America, Parts 1 and 2 by Tony Kushner, Death and the Maiden by Ariel Dorfman, for which, uh, directed by Mike Nichols, for which a Tony, Glenn Close won a, won a Tony Award for Best Actress, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Boy, what a great play. Fred, I didn't know. My goodness. Hurley Burley, Night Mother, and On Golden Pond. His films, and I, I can't go through all of them again, his producer of Ghosts of Mississippi, Quiz Show, The Paper, Mississippi Burning, and on national television, In the Gloaming, and In Search of Our Fathers. That is a very, very partial list of this, of the James Brown of theatrical production, <laughs> the hardest working man <laughs> in show business. Our final panelist is KRS-One, Chris, Mr. Chris Parker. I noticed on Chris's, I, I have to tell you the story before we get to it. I told my son, who is 20 years old and living in San Francisco, that I was making my debut in the forum, which is, for me, a huge deal. But I'm a tiny little part of this. And I told Anthony, I said, now I'm just a tiny little part. And I told him about the panelists. And then he said, oh, Mom, can you get me a tape? And I, for one brief shining moment, I thought it was me that it had the impact on this child. <laughs> and then he says, I want to hear everything KRS has to say. Okay. Well, so do we. <laughs> he is a creative educator, a proud family man, philosopher, and poet, recipient of numerous awards and honors. His professional organizations include the Temple of Hip Hop Culture, where a founder and advisor the Stop the Violence Movement Founder and Advisor, the Children's Health Fund Advisor, and many other organizations. And his day job, he has recorded nine full-length albums for Jive Records, totaling over five million sales, one platinum album, five gold albums, including um, in, in his uh, repertory of albums uh, that he produced, Criminal Minded, By All Means Necessary, and most recently, Maximum Strength, and last year's I Got Next. His publications include The Science of Rap in the Temple of Hip Hop and several articles in Source Magazine, The New York Times, Blaze Magazine, Sonic Net Live, and Internet Chat. He's also one of the most sought after motivational speakers and to youth groups in the country. As you can see, we have a wonderful panel today, so I'm not going to take up any more of their time. I know you guys are going to have lots of questions for them. So please welcome our first panelist to the podium, Michael Pori. The weather report. I predict rain. Um, a recent review by Mark Sweat in the Los Angeles Times of my last opera with composer Stuart Wallace began by quoting the warning sign that appeared magically in the lobby on opening night. Hopper's wife is not for everyone. Long Beach Opera warns its patrons that the production contains nudity, pornography, tobacco smoke, fog, and gunshots. If that's a problem, stay away. The sign became a badge of honor to us, and it didn't bother us either that the critic went on to call the bulk work bold, brave, important, the possible direction for opera in the next millennium. The run sold out, people liked it, and we liked the warning the newspaper quoted so much that we showed it to a lot of other arts festival presenters around the country. That was a miscalculation. 
This litany of potential operatic art hazards was enough to deter them from even listening to the music or reading the libretto for fear that it was too interesting for their audience. When we showed the same quote to opera companies in Europe, they laughed. The point, art forms like opera were once popular forms with a direct connection between the creators and the public. Today there are middlemen, gatekeepers, producers, funders, lawyers concerned about lawsuits. In the eight years since Jesse Helms, things for American artists are different. We're held accountable to someone else's moral vision instead of our own, a responsibility to ennoble life instead of just responding to it as we see fit, with or without funding. Um, we hear much about the artist's responsibility to society, much less about society's responsibility to its art. Today, as we convene to discuss the artist's vision of society, it's clear to those in the thick of it that we are years beyond warnings about censoring artistic vision. It happened. It's happening. It's all around us. Prior restraint, censorship, self-censorship. We are now living in the era of post-censorship. In the case of Hopper's wife, Wallace and I were too stubborn to change what worked. So now this very American work will next appear in Belgium, London, and Germany, instead of Atlanta, Philadelphia, Cambridge, or New York City. Well, what's not to like about Belgium? Good chocolate. Speaking for myself and most of the artists I know in the various disciplines, we don't spend a lot of time considering our purpose to society, if any, and whether or not what we do is altruistic. Certainly writing music, an opera, is not nobler work than any other honest occupation. But if people want to make a fuss about it, insist that artists hold a mirror up to society, great, terrific, let them. We approve of any sentiments that make it easier to get the next piece produced. For me, writing libretti was an acquired compulsion. I've often been asked exactly what it is an opera librettist does, followed by the somewhat rude, what kind of living can you make writing librettos? What else do you do? What I write are the plays the music is set to. In the operas I've written with Wallace, they're all original, not adaptations. I'm an ex-journalist and editor. Wallace is a composer, versed in classical, but drawn to American roots music. We never set out to write operas, but found that the scale and tenor of what we wanted to say just seemed to call out for the stylization inherent in opera. Nor do I believe we ever consciously leapt aboard a bandwagon of issue-oriented works. I believe we are two neurotic and maladjusted Jews who got beat up in the schoolyard because we had to go home to take piano lessons instead of playing football. It fostered a conviction in us that art that isn't rooted in real issues seems not just dull, but dead. And for that, we're still getting beat up. Uh, not having come into the field with any preconceived notions of what an opera should be, we developed our own view of things. When we began collaborating during the Reagan era, we found we only had to look at the headlines for inspiration. It seemed as if the front page of the paper and the funny pages in the back were reversed or blending. News was turning into cartoons. Society seemed pickled. So we wrote a rather bizarre vaudeville opera called Where's Dick? The Dick in question being a missing American comic strip detective in a corrupt metropolis filled with crooks who resembled figures of our own time. We wrote about what made us angry, what made us laugh. Evangelism, politics, the law, business, high society, with no sense of undue responsibility to anyone we might be offending. Where's Dick was produced at Houston Grand Opera in a production directed by Richard Foreman and performed in a huge public arena similar to Tanglewood. The auditorium of 2,000 opened onto a hillside that seated another 5,000. Since it was a quasi public event, and in Houston, there were protests before it even opened, when word got out that the story dealt with violence, child abuse, and that it featured simulated nudity. The Houston Boast accused the opera of resorting to pornography to attract audiences. Naturally, the accusation helped to do just that. Once they came and realized the work was not pornographic, but ironic, outrageous, but seriously outrageous, and featured adorable puppets, they came back and brought their children who loved it, despite the PG warning on the poster, no doubt some kind of first for an opera. 
But despite national notices, lots of notoriety, Where's Dick received no further performances ever at American cop opera companies after its premiere. They gossiped about it. They called us the bad boys of opera behind our backs. But we they were not particularly keen on presenting our abrasive vision of American society, along with their subscription offerings of La Boheme and Ivespri Siciliani. What a pity, because Where's Dick was basically doing the same thing those works did in their own day, responding. It did lead to subsequent new opera commissions, and now almost 10 years later, as you heard, it is going to be made into perhaps the first ever animated cartoon opera for an independent film company by a nihilistic ex-Bugs Bunny animator, Greg Ford. Its a projected release date is two years from now, and its vision of a pickled America seems true, truer to us now than ever. The most recent premiere was Hopper's Wife, the piece that earned us our second warning poster. Um, it explores the conflict between high and low art in the troubled marriage of Edward Hopper and his wife, Mrs. Hopper. She responds to Hopper's mental and physical abuse by evolving into the Hollywood gossip columnist, Hedda Hopper, until in the name of mood be morality, she incinerates all the Hopper paintings she herself posed naked for. I can't say exactly that we began the piece in response to the cultural morality war raging in America, though it fits. But we set it aside anyway to be completed after our fourth collaboration on Biggest Challenge, and that was Harvey Milk. Milk was San Francisco's first openly gay elected official, murdered together with San Francisco Mayor George Moscone on November 27, 1978, 20 years ago this November. Their assassin was the fellow politician Dan White, an all-American policeman, fireman, and Vietnam veteran who put his policeman's gun into his pocket, broke into City Hall by a basement window to avoid the metal detector, and shot the mayor and milk five times each in the back and head at close range using standard police-issue bullets. He did this to protect what he thought were patriotic values. To, to us, this particular American tragedy, I would say, evoked a kind of responsibility that we had not felt before in our art. Uh, it was also an opportunity to crystallize everything we felt about the times we lived in. It was as if the missing hero we looked for in Where's Dick was found in Harvey Milk. We saw a very sweeping canvas, his early years in New York as a closeted Republican stockbroker, the birth of the emerging gay civil rights movement, its struggle for recognition, and the big question to us, can one fairly average individual change the course of his life midstream and change the world? I called on my journalistic background to interview dozens of Milk surviving associates, and many of them remained on hand through the development of the opera. But facts and issues were not enough to sustain a heroic opera, and we came to see Milk as a mythical figure, mixing facts freely with reinvention. We never thought we were writing a so-called gay opera, or gay equivalency opera. That, to us, was the least interesting way to think about it, though I don't doubt that a certain amount of correct thinking like that encouraged people to fund it. But so what? We always knew we were writing an American opera, one key to showing that lay in the character of Dan White. Our perspective on our audience's perspective was that many of the patrons and seasoned subscribers who make up the bulk of opera audiences in America would, in fact, sympathize with White's platform of family values and neighborhood self-determination. It wasn't an inclusive neighborhood activism like Milk's. It was what we referred to in the press as NIMBY, not in my backyard. Yet White was the character we predicted the audience would recognize and relate to, not the ponytail, gay hippie Milk. The challenge was to make them reverse their perceptions. To demonize White would reduce Milk to cardboard. Both had to come from a real place, pit their values against each other, and create a work that asks the question, whose America is this? Directed by Christopher Alden, Milk received productions in three major American opera houses and one in Germany. It has just been released on CD. Like the man himself, it aroused both kudos and denunciations and contributed to the debate of what should or shouldn't be in opera houses. The phrase CNN opera was coined by Peter G. Davis of New York Magazine the week before Milk's Lincoln Center opening 
and though he actually liked it when he saw it, the term has stuck to the opera and categorized what Stuart and I do in a larger sense. I don't mind. If you believe, as Wallace and I do, that opera is total theater, topicality is not any more or less of a problem in opera than it is in drama, film, or fiction. Operas like The Marriage of Figaro were topical ones. I don't know. I have no interest whether our vision of America will stand a test of time. We write for now, not for posterity. Perhaps our vision already seems tame in a day when Ellen DeGeneres comes out on her sitcom to, of all things, increase ratings. The San Francisco Chronicle headlined its Sunday piece about Milk as the mainstreaming of gay culture. Well, I don't consider the assassination of Milk and Moscone part of gay culture. It's part of our shared American history. Insofar as art can fuel the imaginations of new generations to re-examine fact, I hope the opera contributes to Milk's legacy. In the near future, I'll be working on two new um, visions of America, though one of them is set in 1914 Vienna. That's called Dahl, and it's the factual story of an obsessive love affair between Alma Schindler Mahler and Oscar Kokoschka that resulted in him building a life-size doll of her as her surrogate. The composer, Scott Frankel, and I see a parallel between Vienna's fin de siècle and our own American era as we continue to grapple with the same exact man-woman issues of control and self-determination and the notion of what is deemed acceptable art in society. Dahl is going to be directed by Robert Wilson and produced by Stuart Ostro. The other vision is distinctly American, an opera with music by Wallace being produced by Jedediah Wheeler with the working title of High Noon. It examines our collective notion of conflict resolution in contemporary America by exploiting the mythology of the Old West in a scenario of constant gun duels. Though some would argue that we no longer resolve our personal and community conflicts literally with showdowns on Main Street, the question, who blinked first? Who's gunning for you? Continue to resound in our lives. The residents of the 19th century frontier town will stand in for today's hired gunslingers, say Johnny Cochran or Alan Dershowitz. I can't fully define the piece until we begin to interact with the public this summer in community forums as part of the Institute on the Arts and Civic Dialogue. The Institute has been jointly sponsored by American Repertory Theater and the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard and is being directed by Anna DeVere Smith and Andrea Taylor, who is here today with Rob Orchard from ART. As Andrea explained it to my collaborator and me, the Institute will bring together artists of the various disciplines interested in expanding artistic boundaries by exploring issues of race, identity, diversity, community. And as Anna put it, one of the main goals of the program is to find ways to add an artistic component to the national conversation about our differences in order to counteract the media's oversimplification of complex issues. In other words, the feeling that artists have a different take on things and by their nature and experience appreciate the gray area of unresolved questions more than others. Most of us live and work in the gray area. Perhaps my best perspective of the society I write about with Wallace is the one I see at our performances. We're very fortunate that our works have cut across boundaries, prices, locales, to be seen by both subscribers and individuals who have never attended any opera. It was kind of wonderful in a freaky way to see the more staid opera subscribers of the Houston Grand Opera in gowns and tuxedos sitting besides leather and drag queens on opening night of milk. When it was performed in Germany, in German, you could hear a pin drop in the packed house of 2,800 people when it came to the part where Milk argued with the neo-Nazi. And yet, I feel the world of opera has retrenched since my partner and I began working together 10 years ago. Besides the tedious tale of the NEA and its diminished support for new work, Opera America, the National Service Organization, also lost its program to support new works and replaced it with one to encourage revivals of underperformed existing ones. This comes at a time when Time Magazine reports that audiences for opera are growing faster than any other performing art form. Frankly, I don't understand why this should be when I glance at the prices of the tickets. To break even on Harvey Milk, 
the San Francisco Opera had to charge $125 a seat for the entire orchestra and first balcony. I wondered, could many of the Castro neighborhood people the opera was about afford to come and see themselves sing on the stage? On the other hand, they lived the opera, so maybe they weren't the ones who needed to be there. Yet it's an odd feeling to realize you're pouring your heart and guts into something you fervently believe is a vision, but that to many others is primarily an occasion to take their jewelry out of the vault. Thanks. Please welcome our next columnist, uh, producer Fred Zolo. Uh, it's nice to be here. I love Anna's Harvard speak. <laughs> I was just looking at the description of, you know, what is it, uh, the description of what we're doing. It always has these sort of long, complex, <laughs> analytic, what is it called? What are your business? Um, visions. Visions. Where is it? Where is it? Of art <laughs> in America. Visions of America, the artist's there's, there's like, society. There's the perspective, there's always stuff about community in there, and mm -hmm. it's like, What's this new thing called? The Institute of Community Relations and Artists Against the World. And it's, it's, always, it's always dazzling to me, you know, like, it, it sounds like those, like, early communists, you know? They always, like, came up with this big titles, you know? They gave some guy a big title and then they killed him, you know? It's a great book out, by the way, which I highly recommend, and it's photographs of all the early commies, you know, the, the Lenin guys. And how after they, they were in and they'd be in all the photographs and then when they want to get rid of them, they just paint them out of the photograph. So there'd be like five guys standing there and like Barry would be in the middle smiling and everything. And then like two years later, he's dead and he's been painted out and there's like a space. And like some, <laughs> no, I thought of that. I did something actually last night I haven't done in a long time. In fact, I did it twice in a row. Two nights in a row I did, I did something I haven't done. I went to the movies and I, I was really heartened by what I saw. I, I saw two movies in a row, two mainstream, if you will, Hollywood movies. One by Spike Lee, um, not someone I've seen eye to eye a lot, but I admire. And um, the other by Warren Beatty, of all people. And now there's an odd couple. Um, which one will we paint out of that picture, you know, Spike Lee and Warren Beatty? But I was really heartened by what I saw because I don't know if you know about these two movies. The, the Lee movie opened today, I think, uh, around the country. Um, it's called He Got Game, uh, which I guess is some sort of, well, Chris will explain that to us. He, I, I guess it means something like he can play basketball, right? In a cosmic sense. And, uh, like higher than that. <laughs> Actually, it's funny because I'm on both soundtracks, Bullworth <laughs> and the. Uh, there you go. And that was so. <laughs> See, you might have, you might have thought that was kind of a spontaneous thing that I brought this up, but I was handed a couple of hundred bucks by his record company. <laughs> Plug these two movies that. The but, both these pictures were big and kind of exciting and about something and flawed, like all great things are. I mean, I mean, the Empire State Building is flawed, you know? I mean, think great things are flawed, like, and what's all that stuff behind the Mona Lisa exactly, you know, if you, to look at it for, they're great things are flawed, and these are two big, kind of flawed things that I was so excited by, because these are two studio pictures. Um, Disney is releasing the Spike Lee picture, which is unfathomable to me, actually, and um, the other is Rupert Murdoch's company, I think it's called the News Corporation, since there's no news in any of his newspapers. I, I, I don't know what that... But I, I'm talking about, obviously, pictures you haven't seen, but I, I was very, very heartened, and it, and it made me remember the, why I got into this life in the first place. And it actually started not far from here, because I, I started in, in, Bo in Boston theater, uh, if that's not an oxymoron. Um, with Rob Orchard sitting here. Okay. <laughs> Rob, of course, is from Cambridge Theater. It's a, um, I, um, we started this company about 25 years, almost 25 years ago now, and, and we, we decided to take the, uh, the, as a sort of 
motto, uh, ars gratia artis, is, uh, I think that's MGM's motto, um, but ours was this remark from H.L. Mencken, renowned columnist and anti-Semite, um, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I, in the end, I think that in one sentence, that's what art should do, and particularly popular art. And this notion that it should be, people say, well, I don't want to go see, I don't want to go see Bullworth, which is what the Warren Beatty, I mean, because it's, you know, is it entertaining? Is there like a big monster in it? Uh, does, is there like an alien in it who like, you know, is there, I, I don't want to see that. I want to, I want to be entertained. And the, and the idea of being able to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable and do films and theater and television and also have a good time is, is a, is what our goal was. I'm, I'm, I remember, in fact, doing a play, one of the early plays at the Charles Playhouse. It was a play called Sexual Perversity in Chicago. And um, the, uh, I showed up at the theater for the opening night, and the Boston police were padlocking the theater. And I thought, this is great. You know, the play's called Sexual Perversity in Chicago. Um, and the police are padlocking the theater. They're trying to stop free speech. And th let's get the Boston Globe and I think the record American was around then, a news corporation paper. And um, of course, they weren't padlocking the theater because of anything about sexual arrest in Chicago or about the fight for free speech, but because we hadn't paid the rent on the theater. <laughs> and a man named Frank Chagru, who owned it at that time, wanted his rent before the play could go on. And I realized the very intimate and complicated connection between art and commerce. Um, which is why I took the money to plug Chris's soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll go back to these two pictures. I'm not plugging them. I have nothing to do with them whatsoever. Uh, Spike Lee is not a friend of mine. Warren Beatty is a friend of mine. But it mean, I found both these pictures to be really very exciting. And they were about things that mean a lot to me. They were about race. And they were about fathers and sons. And they were about powerful emotions that run through all of us. And there are two filmmakers who had total control over these films because they're there are other artists involved, but these two guys who really put their stamp on these things, and they, they really made a statement, and it heartened me, because I often am, get really, really cynical about what I do. And in fact, I'm actually going to kind of take a break from doing what I do, which some people who know me are happy about, but I'm actually going to come here and do what Anna has done, and um, come up with Harvard Speak forums, you know, like, and mention community a lot, because that's kind of very important. And, <laughs> take some time away to actually try to get some perspective to see how, how we can, can do things that can change the way people think about things and how we can, we can, we can make trouble again, uh, good and bad trouble. And because I've gotten a little unhappy about what I've seen, I, I, I think size does matter, but I don't give a flying fuck about Godzilla. And I'm just kind of really tired of it. And so I got heartened when I saw this. And, and so it just sat, sat in my brain, and, it, and I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, and I'm looking forward to actually being here in, in Cambridge, and it's in Veyron's, and interacting with kind of people a little bit younger than me, even though Anna made me sound 100 years old, um, and, and trying to get my edge back. Because if Warren Beatty at age 60, and let's face it, this man's lived a life, OK? I mean, we won't even we won't go into Julie Colbert. Christie, all right? You know, or, his, or his long affair with Anna. <laughs> But, um, and he can still come, come around again and, and actually get his edge back, then maybe, maybe I can too. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> I'm not having an affair with Warren Beatty. Our next, I'd like to welcome our next panelist, KRS-One, Chris Parker. <laughs> Um, actually, I, again, let me thank you for both plugs of uh, Bullworth soundtrack and uh, Spike Lee, He Got Game soundtrack. Please run out, go get a copy of both of those. <laughs> um, let me just say real briefly in, in, in terms of art, uh, we deal with art, and when I say we, I mean in terms of hip hop culture, the whole thing, MC and breaking, DJing, graffiti art, so on and so on. We deal with culture 
in terms of, I'm sorry, not culture, we deal with art in terms of life and death. And in the sense of this, in, in this kind of way, the death of art or art as an artifact, meaning it died, it was alive. This is an artifact. It was alive at one time. This thing was alive when it was being made. The spontaneousness of when this thing was actually being made is what hip hop considers art. In addition to this, now it's dead. Death to art is when you try to define art, meaning I wrote down a definition here. This is art in its death stage. Art, activity of creating things that arouse the emotions through one or more senses. That's an artifact, a fact. Here is an art effect, meaning here is art in effect. Nobody does it do it quite like we do it does it. Some tried to do it, but they fake and we knew it. Was it true that was saying that hip hop was decaying, that it wasn't lasting? We blasting and passing with a passion, your style and your fashion. Unmasking America, massive hysteria. If you want the real, KRS will take care of you. A name well known in all inner city areas. I'm not your superior or inferior. I'm in your interior. That's why I'm hearing you. I bust a rhyme like a last Boy Scout and beat a Punisher like Fat Joe, no doubt. <laughs> to the beach, y'all, you don't stop. On stage, it ain't about your hit. You gotta grab the microphone like a bone all alone. The skills that are shown leaves the whole place blown. The place that I'm talking about be hip hop. The place I'll be walking about be hip hop. MCing, DJing, graph, breaking, beatboxing, philosophy, and management. To these arenas in hip hop, be passionate. Some be attacking it, but we're not having it. In the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh. KRS, thank you. Are these working? Are these working okay? Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, while any of you have questions, please feel free. The microphones are on either side. And as Alan Simpson always says, because um, I, I get to moderate, I also get to ask the first question. <laughs> That's the only privilege I'll take today. I want to talk about myth-making. Is that a function of the artist? How important is this function? And when I say myth making, we talked about this in our study group. I think that at one point, Robin Hood was probably a thug. I mean, think about it. He was probably a gangbanger. He wore colors, green. He had a gang. They were called his merry men. They had a hood. It was called Sherwood Forest. And he lied, and he cheated, and he stole. The part about giving to the poor, I suspect, came along later when the mismaking machine kicked in. Is that a function of the artist? For instance, in Bullworth, I went to the screening in Washington, D.C., and a lot of the black people who were at the screening, Mr. Warren was there, Mr. Beatty was there, they thought the movie was very interesting. They loved parts of it. They loved the soundtrack, by the way. <laughs> but they had a problem with <laughs> They had a problem with depicting um, six-year-old black kids in their neighborhood with guns selling crack, even as a satirical device. And they knew it was a satirical device. They had a problem with that. As you said, it was a, it was a flawed um, piece of artistic vision. But it, parts of it are, are, are excellent. My question to anyone on the panel that wants to take it is, how important is the mismaking function for the artist? Do they, do they have a responsibility there? And how important is it for our culture? Uh, if I could just jump in. You um, may. Uh, just let me be clear, though, about who's creating the myth, meaning that uh, our myths, like we could look at the same thing and create two different myths. Uh, is this the myth of the so quote unquote mainstream, or is this the creation of myth of the underground? Which myth? Because it, it would help me answer the question better. Pick a myth, any myth. Underground, of course. There you go. <laughs> 
Well, in our situation, the myths are created by a certain degree of pressure and power. Uh, well, we have a saying that's called money, power, respect is the key to life. And the pursuit of this, I think, is the fundamental creation of our myths. Money, power, respect. We want it, <clears throat> meaning we, the not only the ones who partake in the creation of the myth, but the ones who also are affected by the myth itself, it's our wants and our dreams that we see in other people that become the myths or what we aspire to be. Uh, and someone might even lie about it, um, especially in the underground where nobody has nothing. Uh, we'll lie and say, or not even lie, but maybe visualize um, or affirm uh, in our mind's eye that uh, we have the things that we don't really have materially. Uh, we may never get them. But if I say it right now on the mic, I wish I had a large uh, larger, I, I want Poland Spring, not Naya. Now, uh, if I never got Poland Spring, my dream of getting Poland Spring becomes all of their dreams of getting Poland Spring. And on the underground, in terms of hip hop, that's how things are created. This is how it's, we first aspire to succeed, to overcome whatever we are uh, afflicted by. And through that overcoming it, we create our myths as we go along, as they see fit for us. Now, the myths we create might not be the myths that everyone else has as well. The same creation, like the same thing that might create a myth, uh, you know, two people can look to, like, uh, you know, you might want, I said Poland Spring, you might say Evian, but whoever he is speaking to, or whoever he is representing through art, I guess, uh, be, that becomes the myth. He sets the trend. I think the artist sets the trend for the myth, but it's the people that fortify it and carry it and keep it going and keep it moving as a creation. But is that necessarily a myth? You see, there's truth, there's false. Maybe art is lying, or maybe it's a higher form of truth. I think myths are about gods, and certain times it's appropriate to make a god. Is myths about God? Well, really? are they? What's the definition of a myth? That I folk, think folklore, folk tale. I mean, I, I would say, uh, I, I wouldn't equate I myth just, just with, with God. I just don't think that we can call all art a myth or every fictional invention a myth. I think it's important to keep certain distinctions because it's more useful to us. We have more options the more distinctions we keep. And we also don't blur the lines, which ultimately always puts us in trouble. But where's the definition? Um, how was how the do we define? How do we define Fred, ourselves? How would you define well, I think that uh, in art, I, Faulkner once wrote that it's not the facts that interest us, but the truth. And I, I think that if you're, there is a notion of trying to reach for a higher good, if you will, uh, and whether it's Warren Beatty or Spike Lee or even, anyone who's actually trying to do something, whether they succeed or not. Uh, August Wilson, you know. Um, August Wilson wrote a play about a guy who was a great baseball player but couldn't, could never break into the major leagues because he was black. And so he passed along to his son both the ability to love baseball and become a great player, but the knowledge, the explicit knowledge that you can never play in the big leagues. So he's passed along the love of the game and the, and the talent and the training, but, you, but you're going to be frustrated like me, and you're, going to, and you're going to hate your situation, your lot in life. When his son comes up to him and says, wait a minute, but Dad, it's changed. I can play in the big leagues now. He says, no, you can't. You can't. You just can't. You can't. Wait a minute, I gave you all of this, but you've got to take the frustration with it. You gotta look at the world in that, in the way I do. You gotta look at the world as I was deprived of my, of my chance, and I'm a truck driver now. I drive a, gar a garbage truck. And like, you know, that's the way you're gonna have to be. And he said, no, 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 I can go further. I, I can go further. I'm gonna rewrite, I'm gonna rewrite history. I'm gonna rewrite history in my, in my image now. In my image, I'm gonna move a step forward. And th these two men stopped communicating in fences at that point. They can no longer speak. No, you can't do this. If you try to do it, they'll knock you down. They'll, they'll call you names. They'll beat you. No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Jackie Robinson did it. I can do it. He's a, you know, he's a fluke. He's going to be gone. There won't be others. 
but there will be others. And people rewrite history with their, with their pursuit of the truth. If you are actually pursuing something greater, something larger, even if you fail, even if, 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 if that's, that's, all that, that's all that matters to me. That's what God is. That's, I mean, I, I have my own Catholic view of God, my ringing of the bells as I did as an altar boy. It was great too, because people had to stand up, sit down, you know. Particularly when they were kneeling. People hate to kneel, by the way. And I'd make them kneel for a really long time, you know, and I'd linger my fingers over those, you know, chimes, you know. And then I'd pull them back a little bit. The standing up and down, yeah. Oh, the standing up and down. But the kneeling was long, long, long. <laughs> particularly when the priest was particularly drunk. <laughs> And he was admiring a young altar boy out of the corner of his eye. On that note, we'll start taking questions from the audience. <laughs> I, did like, I did like Anna's denial about the Warren Beatty affair. I did not sleep with that man. It was positively presidential, wasn't it? It was. Um, I think Warren Beatty is a myth. <laughs> we're going to start with this gentleman over here, and then we're going to go to this one, and then we're going to go either way. Please. Okay. My name is Brent Dusing. I'm an undergraduate at Harvard. This is directly for KRS-One. Um, I've been listening to your music since about 1989, since I was about in fifth or sixth grade. And um, in 1990, on uh, entertainment, I heard you talk a lot about uh, the industry and commercial, uh, the commercialization of rap music. Um, a lot of what it had done to, I think you were directly addressing the NWA phenomenon and also uh, what had been happening with Two Life Crew and how they had gotten a lot more commercial success than groups such as yourself and Public Enemy. Um, in 92, you talked, again, you and Freddie Fox talked a lot on the Sex and Violence LP about uh, the commercialization of artists, especially the song How Not to Get Jerked was about how artists are, um, I mean, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but it was basically about the commercialization of artists once again. In 95, on the Funkmaster Flex album, you had a, your last speech was about that you'd never go commercial, that you'd never sell out. Now, one of the, <coughs> I just want to say, one could of we just have, we need to really, because we've got a lot of people that have questions, okay. so if we could have a question. This is, there is a question. Um, I wanted to say quickly that one of the credentials that you didn't give him when you stood up and addressed him is that he's one of the few rappers still around this, since 85, is that right? That's still selling records, that's still respected in the industry. And that's very rare for rap music. So my question is, however, now in, 90, in 96 you did the Sprite commercial with MC Shan. In 97 you did the soundtrack with the Shaquille O'Neal movie. You've got two, soundtrack, um, two soundtracks you're doing now. Sure. My question is this. You were so anti-commercialism when I listened to you, and then I saw you go into doing a Sprite commercial or doing question, soundtracks please. for commercial movies. Why is it that um, is it that you have gotten commercial success now because hip hop and your message has been more respected, or have you had to change your message and what you've been doing to get credentials from commercial and um, and, and large industrial organizations? Thank sure. you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, actually, the answer to your question is actually both. Uh, the, in, on, on, on the first part, um, my underground, or what I was calling the underground in 1986, became the mainstream of 1996. It was something I couldn't stop. It just happened. Uh, all the people that bought uh, our first album in 1987 became Coca-Cola executives. So they called me up and said, look, we got a couple of million dollars to do a commercial. We know that uh, you, know, you and MC Shan had this uh, MC competition. You know, we could restore the culture, and at least in the sense of showing kids how to battle. It's not about, let, let me just stop real quick, and I'll try to be short with, with the answer, but for the audience to understand. Uh, it, within hip hop culture, MCs, meaning uh, you might know them as rappers, uh, they verbally compete with one another in what is called battling. Sometimes we win money, uh, recording deals, et cetera, et cetera. I started in the industry battling, uh, verbally competing with this other artist called MC Shan. Uh, as the story's told, we had two records going out back and forth, and then we finally won the battle and went on and so on and so on. But going back to uh, your, the first part of, of your question, um, MC Shan, myself, Mr. Magic, Fly Tie, Red Alert, all of the people involved in that whole thing all became mainstream. Uh, we couldn't stop it because nothing we can do about it. All of a sudden, everybody who was pushing the buttons in, in movie companies, in soundtrack uh, uh, departments of record companies, marketing, promotion, they grew up. 
and I grew up with them. And as a result, I lost in a in, in a in a way um, in about around 1992 to 1994. I lost a, in a way the respect of the youth. Uh, because they felt I wasn't dancey enough. Uh, it was too conscious, too preachy, preachy. So, you know, the youth got away from KRS One as an artist and really started coming to the lectures or wanting to see me speak. But I got back into the music when in around 1984, 85, when not only my whole audience, all my peers as well, grew up, but what, what we call like the underground like what Puffy's doing right now mm -hmm. is what we used to do in 1987, uh, except he's doing it technologically, and we did it with two turntables. But it's the it's hard to understand. But look, look at this, Rappers Delight. You remember yeah. the Sugar Hill Gang? Sure. In that record, this is the first rap record of all time, right? Well, fat back band is supposed to be, but Rappers Delight, sure. the first common rap record. Their lyrics is the same thing that Puffy, Little Kim, and all of the mainstream artists are saying today. The trouble is, how do you remain, like I could just sit here and have a beef and just say the world is wrong, everything's wrong, everything's messed up, this is the underground. <laughs> or... But that's why people bought your records. Please, huh? we have sorry. to get to another question. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a great question. Um, how, how, how do I clarify this? Uh, that was what it was in 87 under the Reagan Bush era, really Bush era. Uh, we had a lot more to argue about. Now today, <laughs> now hip hop um, has not only very little to argue about, but internally we have a problem, internally, or had a problem with the death of Tupac and Biggie. Uh, we started to fight amongst ourselves and sort of the shift shifted from what's going on outside to what's going on inside. And I think, you know, times change, things change. I will always remain as underground as I could possibly be, but I can't lie about my situation now. In 1987, I had a freestyle fix bike. Today I got a Range Rover. It's a different situation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just different. And if I and I could say to my audience, I could say, you know, look, stay on that bike, stay on the bike, be hardcore. But that's not really what's happening. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> This is a question for KRS-One also. Um, I, I'm not sure I agree with you that there, I mean, I think maybe there was more to be focused on uh, with Reagan and Bush, but I'm not sure. I'm we really do have to take yeah. a question. Yeah, it's a question. It's just, I just think there are things, there's plenty to sure. deal with today as well. Let us clarify that. Um, and one, one of those things is something that you have uh, uh, written about in okay. your music, and that's what I want to ask you about. Sure. You did a piece about Mumia Abu-Jamal, yes. which was very important to a lot of people who care about yes. his uh, situation on death row in Pennsylvania, and mm -hmm. I wonder if you could uh, talk about it and talk about how it came about and sure. the significance, the, the meaning of, of doing that kind of a, of a piece. Right. Uh, well, as an artist, uh, I feel that it's my responsibility I use that word very loosely, but I do respect it. And uh, I feel that it's, it's my responsibility to not really put out what I think uh, the people would like to hear or enjoy or be aware of, but to be a reflection of what people already think. Meaning that I have the option of saying, look, did you know this? Did you know that? Did you know the other? And bring awareness. But the other side of it is to become the audience itself and simply speak from the perspective of the collective, not the individual. So I say this because with the record with, with Mumia, it, it, was, it was pretty much these two things that funneled everything. It was sort of like me knowing, I mean, I was a, a very much a part of the protest movement in New York that, that, that uh, well, I don't want to get into Giuliani and all of that and, and, and all of them, but I became very passionate about um, 
I would like to say civil rights leaders, but really human rights leaders uh, of the 60s and how they're still in jail, still in prison, a, a lot of them. Uh, and we're still living, see, we're living in a time today where, you know, the Black Panther movie came out. And this is like national, you know, everybody's watching this movie, you know, or you have the option to watch the movie. And they're blatantly saying that the FBI la launched a counterintelligence program that